Welcome to Kitchen Table Reading Series. This is our seventh episode. Uh, we have a lot to celebrate today. We have Pride Month, we have Juneteenth weekend, we have Father's Day, and we have the one year anniversary of uh, this series. With so much happening in the world and with some gorgeous weather here on the East Coast, uh, I really appreciate all of you joining uh, today. Um, and as always, we have a, a stellar lineup of poets for you. We have Rosebud Benoni and we have Nathan McLean. And uh, to celebrate the one year mark, I'm gonna call my own number and, and read some poems for you today as, as well. Um, before we arrive at the readers, our regular attendees know that we have a special keeping the lights on section. Um, the spirit of this series is uh, non-commercial. Um, but so I don't do long bios, right? Um, and I, I don't try to sell you anything, but poets, if you want poetry, poets do have to eat. So during the reading, I'll throw a list of the poets' uh, most recent poetry collections into the chat. And I do hope you'll buy a copy of their books, preferably at your local bookstore, which seem to be having a comeback these days, which I'm happy to see. Um, I'm also indebted to the Solstice uh, MFA program, which is my, spiritual poetry home away from home. Um, Solstice allows me to use their Zoom account for these webinars and, and that generosity is sort of indicative of the greater generosity of, of the program. Um, we're a group of committed diverse writers who push each other to perfect our craft um, in a variety of genres from children's lit to nonfiction to poetry. So if you're interested in um, exploring your writing skills in a supportive close-knit community, check us out. They're readily available on the internet. Um, all right, let's get into the poetry. Um, as you know, I start and end the reading with a poem. Today, I wanted to start and end with uh, two sections of Cyrus Cassell's multi-section poem, Down from the Houses of Magic, uh, which appears in his book, Soul, Make a Path Through Shouting. Uh, here's the fifth, fifth section of that poem for you. The dirty, nail-bitten hand of a black leer with the green and pink bracelets of a woman, inching its way through garbage. Even in the garden on Gull Hill, I see that hand all day, rocking back and forth between Turk cap lilies and the trash. Till at last words spill out, ones I shrink from. Are you hungry all the time? Yes, all the time. Oh, grant us strength to fashion a table where each of us has a name. All right, we are gonna move. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping in, in this new political regime, we can fashion a table where each of us has a, has a name. Um, things things like, seem like they're headed in that direction, but always wanna make sure. Uh, all right, let's move in, into the poets who came to hear. Um, feel free to be active in the chat before, during, and after uh, the poet's readings, um, especially because we can't see your, your shining faces. Um, first up, joining us from Queens is Rosebud Benoni. Hi, everyone. Happy Father's Day. Happy uh, Sunday. Happy first day of summer. And happy Rick and Morty Day. Um, I have a poem in my Alice James book from Rick and Morty. So that is what I'm going to read. Um, it's called Poet Wrestling with Rick and Morty, but mostly Rick. And if you've seen the show, you know, right? It's all about the heart, they say, that cross, that shine to compromise. Either you are creator or you die on some pagan holiday. Most everything we get twisted. Most everything is either sh science or shockwave of endless favor. The asking, the ridiculous heart getting lit on blood that never dries on marked doors of unrequited sin. Who do you think you are? I've wed my own body vermilion, blushing in brickish electric plush these organs. Make my spleen a shrine to excess. Who doesn't have time for infinite timelines? Is not your greatest fear, unity, that horse I am eternally breaking? Is that a new dress? Try the heart you left to gray and shiver and crawl space. 
false hearts floating through failing body, same hearts spoiling other hearts sulfuric and weed whack. How they beat beneath the changing of forces. Either love yourself or trust a woman who changed doorposts and signs to unidentified equine. Either are or return to sender. You say the aim of being you is being you and creation alone is the favor when all language will always escape and betray its creator. You don't know what you were saying of infinite pain. Please help me. Either horses change to natural disasters or frozen ground heaves the silence of its ruins. Now it's time to walk. Wipe your face off with pure glycerine and sage. Creation is a spell of double negation. <clears throat> so I'm also going to read a new poem. I've been working on some new work that uses um, the unsolved problem in physics to deal with domestic violence and sexual assault. Um, and one of the main guiding principles in this new collection is the arrow of time, which I'll, I'll knock down two principles of it, um, is that one, once an event happens, it can't unhappen. And as time goes on, entropy in, increases. Um, so this particular poem deals with quantum entanglement, which, you know, to put it in Cliff Notes version, essentially we are all on one wavelength. And so when something, you know, like a billion light years away, and I'm exaggerating, but you get the point, is that, that can, that's a billion light years away and it can influence what's happening right here at my not kitchen table, um, and that everything is entangled. Um, so I wrote this poem, Mataro's Wrestling with Uncanny Action at a Distance, to sort of explore the power of two points in which one says they control the other. Abuse lingers a strange fog in the aster. It putters in casual skims, strange and faux rafters, where I am not still nor get away after, paying gossamer and grays, entangles and staff and baffle, flows motion in all its range of cloak and dagger, lingers too long in its actors, who never not trying to capture won't let me stray for how you loved Say, like Churchill, not the first who never stopped painting his pond, the one he had taken to root after his beloved, his marigold was gone among the cattails, I imagine it wasn't this story who took captive a love trying to get away. Such formaling and chumming laughter, I too am not still a thing of your after like how everything has not but is a measurement problem, like how a painting or roof cannot be the same when beloved is befouled and betrayed. No, it will not be the same. Even with the most severe and unrelenting eye cannot victory over the length of a wave. No marigold can be remade a mine. She and I couldn't be more different from all of you and all of I only understand that kind of tender rage as one who does all she can do all her life to stop the arrow of time, which he didn't, which you speak softly flitting away at the beam with ice pick enclosing distance. And if it all ends with a whimper, if it all goes blank, who cannot dismiss there are things like goldfish that swim faster than light, far from coal hell days into wilderness, far from men who never step aside. It's that kind of entanglement, the incendiary to refuse what clearly makes and moves those hands through arbitrary and wide. When we reach each other's twisted line, you say yours is the first that speaks of what the second will do, no matter 
you'll always know you always find we're all oh how i once loved you how i was never spilled to fuse no i'm not the other end of your every oath and every ruse it's not the same what i feel even the smallest things that linger those i have yet to lose Um, so keeping in the spirit of sharing others' readings, um, I took part in this great anthology embodied uh, by Wendy and Tyler Chin Tanner. And I'm going to read a poem from uh, the poet Kinsey Allen called Red Woman. If I am blood ruled, let it be as every pinch of tobacco taken from medicine pouches and forcibly tucked under the white shirt of a 13 year old girl now empty even of prayer, or a girl whose last sight is the river, or a girl whose last sight is the river, or a woman whose last sight is the anger even before the river, or a boy who grabs a knife and calls the cops and tells them his own description. I tell you, that's despair. I know well. I'm cuter with my mouth shut sexy with two black grays the words sound better when i don't speak them at all so they tell me i'm all anger and a bad giver a riot waiting to happen in that little short skirt they say they asked me to wash my hair in the river just to see what it would have been like smile they say those grays are dangerous they say where are you walking so late at night? And this poem again is called Red Woman by Kinsey Allen. And it's in the anthology Embodied. Um, and it's, you'll have to see it, but it's poetry comics and it's really cool. Um, so I started this series in 2019 called um, The Atomic Sonnet to honor the periodic table's 150th birthday. I also guest edited a uh, poetry, a chemistry poetry portfolio for Pleiades um, because I was so excited about the periodic table's 150th birthday and I wanted you to be as well. Um, so <laughs> Black Warrior Review was kind enough to um, publish a chapbook of mine that we made free and available online uh, during the pandemic in 2020. Um, so I'm just going to read a few of the sonnets from that. Um, one of my favorite elements is Iridium, and I wrote this on it's called 77 IR. Are you dense? I'm the baddest kiss. If there's one boss left, it's not you on this stage. Aquaragia, step off. Come caustic creek corrosion and stay salty, my rainbows. To the gods, your one hit pun. My iris will weather and true whatever is burning up you. I bless a compass with its bearings and the crucible I keep unhurried and sane when under fever and fury of flame. I'm the iron lore that celestials this molten core, chasmed the crustaceous and shook all legion in sky and sea, boomed your beloved dinosaurs and unknown beasts. Believe a lot of comet I did not cherry bomb in peace, how I still brittle that kiss. Why expose me now, tis not my rage. I'm a precious pinch, more mint than platinum's greatest thick. I don't need to lay it on. I, for when you go amiss, I, come on, don't quit. And the only boss, make a wish on the stage. <clears throat> and so I worked in a lot of the, the, um, the elements chemical properties into the sonnet. And so I wrote them where you wouldn't need to know them to enjoy the sonnet. But I've done a few poetry readings to, to chemistry classes, especially during the pandemic. And it was just kind of exciting to see um, their eyes light up um, when they recognized I was, you know, making puns or something or, or using symbols. Um, so I included a glossary in the back of 20 Atomic Sonnets um, if you wanted to know more. And again, that's, it's free, you know, you can just look it up online. Um, so I also included, um, the sonnets about the electron. I am obsessed with the electron. 
this whole thing about the Higgs boson being the God particle. I mean, we knew about the Higgs field for years. I mean, that was no big deal to me in 2012. Um, to me, it's all about the electron. Quarks are one thing. The electron is fantastic. Um, so I wrote this one poem about the positron, um, which is the electron twin, you could say. So this is called E negative for the positron. I'm such positon positron trash for you. Don't not speak to me of cloud chambers and stability. I'm a lead head kind of lech into mutual annihilation. I wreck to redead, molt, rinse, roulette. Cross me and goodbye horses, slashed winged Pegasus. I'm as irreal as it gets, always behind of you. That half step you don't have off the ledge. I last as long as skitter, as burned out barns that neigh and nicker, and I've proved nothing completes you. I was there long before your ancestors kicked and cleaved from hooves a grip. I'm, what, I'm why you no longer flip over shallow stream and sharp teeth while you gallop senselessly towards dreams. I let you master by teaching us to kill each other. I'm absolute trash for you. Thank me, the muddy spin who never enough us bends every leap to its knees. I'm why you rip the dearest of kin from paradise to null and den. Um, so I'll just read one more poem um, of my own and then I'll close with a poem from somebody else. Um, it's Father's Day, so my father is not really big on secular holidays. Um, my mother, I'm sure everyone is, you know, familiar with, you know, how the United States works, right? But my mother is a uh, is Mexican and she converted from Catholicism uh, to Judaism to marry my father who left his very religious observant Jewish family uh, in pursuit of his own life. And even though he's very observant and I was raised in an observant household, he never really, um, I think he never fully became what a lot of people associated with, not Americanism, but just I don't know, he's a strange person. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that I grew up in a very strange household where my father was a very solitary person even when he was in a room full of people. And people would say to me, oh, that's just very Jewish of him. And I always thought that was sort of a strange thing to say. Um, so today being Father's Day is kind of weird because I did remember when I was younger, I tried to wish him a happy Father's Day. And he said to me, well, you, you know, you honor your, you honor your father and mother right, which is in Torah, uh, you honor your father and mother all the time. You don't just do one day. And that really made me rethink secular holidays in general, like birthdays and anniversaries and all of that. Um, and yet I was born on Valentine's Day and he's always really celebrated that. So I don't know. Anyway, um, I wrote this poem, Poet Wrestling with Her Empire of Dirt, um, in a time in which I was questioning um, everything in my life, the existing framework from science to family to faith um, because my own health was falling apart. And when I got my diagnosis, um, it, there's, well, there's no cure for what I have. And there's also, there's no one set prognosis. Everyone's case is different. And so I was really flailing around and, and looking for answers. So naturally I turned to my very solitary taciturn father who we had those conversations. Poet wrestling with her empire of dirt. Abba says in a blizzard, fill the bathtub with firewood. Abba says a leaky roof is a blessing, provided the bucket to melt snow with fire we gather. All the trees and queens shake and shiver. My axe cannot approximate. My axe is a plastic bottle filled with club soda. I wonder when it unfreezes, will it explode? Abba says light of my eyes. Where are you getting your science? I no longer know. I used to believe in string theory, but the field breaks too many rules. And you can't quantify nor quantum even a drop of rain. Everything's just too damn big for models that would prove the rules tried and still not true. The roof is always leaking. The bathtub is a mass grave of trees. 
Abba says, go outside before it's too late. But I have, I've seen. In a public bathroom, I hide with many other women from a storm. The leaky roof fills with cinders and once more, a dead bird. One of us screams, they all scream, when I pick him up off the slimy floor, pick the maggot from his body. Soon I have the bathroom to myself in public. I have an entire sanctuary of sorts to mourn. When I bring the dead home, Abba tears at his clothes and covers the mirrors, won't let me burn the body. Says even birds died in the show of desperate hungry hands days before the bodies were turned to ash. Perhaps this bird too descends from a lone survivor. We cry for his mother. We cry for my grandmother. Free up the bathtub and flood our home with rainwater. Float a burning empty pyre. I say, Abba, this isn't what we do either. Abba says it's too late to go outside, which I do, I try. I dig and dig for dirt to find my father. I lose the feeling in my hand and snow that doesn't quite stick to the ground. Night falls and his body stays warm under my layers drenched from sleet and sweat. I won't give in. Birds gather around me, dark light against blue cement. They wait it out. They stay perfectly still, right out in the open. So I'll close with one other poem from Embodied, and this is from the editor uh, herself, Wendy Chen Tanner. It's called Birth. Bone scraping labor is nothing like the pangs that racked me for days after the vacuum emptied my womb and what spilled from me was bleak and necrotic. For years I was tethered to terror, led by the nose a beast pierced through its septum. I had cast veils over it, defiance, denial, and through it had left my sight smoke still issued from my mouth as if I had swallowed fire as if its violence had smoldered and sunken down into ash, live embers, still glowing now in the volcanic surges in the burning ring as she crowns she leaves my dwindling starless night as sacrum and pelvis and inward spiral let go, I yield, I open, my body turns itself inside out. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rosebud. That was that was wonderful. I really appreciate the the range of of those poems and of, of your poems in general, from like the the cosmic sense early on when you're kind of exploring time and space to to the humor of the the atomic sonnets. I laughed out loud in, in the kitchen when you said, "I'm into mutual annihilation," which is that's probably my dark humor. <laughs> Um, and then the, the vulnerability of the, the last poem of your own that, that you read, that, that ending really um, resonated with me. They, they stay perfectly still right out in the, in the open. Thank you so much for those poems. Um, all right, I'm gonna uh, call my own number here. I'm reading in the Hudson Valley and in Austin, New York, just a little north of the city. Um, and I wanted to, to read some of my own poems because it's the one year anniversary of the series. The series was started in the wake of um, uh, George Floyd's killing and, and wanting to find some sort of community in the midst of the, the pandemic lockdown, some, some space where we could share poems about what's important to us and what's happening in, in our society along um, multiple viewpoints and, and, and multiple vectors. Um, and it's been, we've had such, for those of you, I, I know some of you have been to most, if not all of these readings, we've had some wonderful poets um, roll through and, and some really great perspectives and just some stirring evocative work that has kept me thinking as we've done this every other month. So I'm thankful to all the poets who have, have rolled through um, and they've definitely informed my own work that, that I've been putting together when I can over this, this last year. So I'm gonna share four poems of my own that I've written um, over the past year. Um, 
I've also, it, we're going to continue with a, a sonnet theme, I suppose. It's always interesting to see what what little themes crop up during these readings. One is that that we established before we let you in is that almost no one reads from their kitchen table, um, which has been funny. I think we have under 50% of people have actually read from the kitchen table. And I've learned that people who live in cities, whether it's San Francisco, Chicago, New York, do not have kitchen tables. So that's been part of my education in this series. Um, but I've been writing these um, sort of broken sonnets that don't really um, adhere to many of the rules of sonics, except you'll hear some, some rhymes and they have um, uh, an octet and a, ses a sestet, sometimes more than one. Uh, this poem's a little about uh, my tortured relationship to Michael Jackson. Never can say goodbye, double plus sonnet. Half my bad racial memories from childhood happened at middle school dances. The blonde boy who snatched the fresh Malcolm X hat off my head threw it down into a dance floor mess of fruit punch and footprints and told me, you're not black, stop pretending. Entire careers made of policing that line when we refused to run patrol for them. At another dance, I was ringed by leering white faces that belted out, it don't matter if you're black or white. I wasn't sure what those faces meant, but I knew they meant to hurt. I've never held that lyric against Michael Jackson. I do find though, listening to his old albums, those Jackson 5 records with cuts like Never Can Say Goodbye has gotten hard. These days, I know how that story ends. The descent into dysmorphic madness, the predatory doors locked behind boys, one stolen childhood thieving another. My better angels think it's wrong to separate the art from the artist. I hated learning pound in school when we all knew he was a fascist and anti-Semite. He should have stayed locked in the gorilla cage of his hate. But then I admit Miles Davis has lodged brass notes irrevocably under my fifth rib. And some of those notes he bent while blocking and bluing Cicely Tyson. Cicely goddamn Tyson. And on the night MJ died, I danced to his music in a circle of dancers until my shirt was sweat stuck to my chest, until I stank with grief. I didn't know then all that now disgust father me, the doors, the boys. But the hard truth is, if the king of pop died today, I don't think I could stop myself from letting hips sway to music that, especially in the writhing all night body rock of a house party. But even in my mother's shy mezzo soprano pushed past joy to abandon. These moral currents run the other way too. The blonde boy who snatched the X hat off my head when a young man walked into a gas station store to find a woman being beaten by her boyfriend. And when the blonde boy went to stop him, the boyfriend ignited a lighter and touched it to the boy's shirt, which burned until it curled into a sneer and then stuck to his white skin. Um, my next sonnet comes out of uh, a particular experience of being mixed race and, and because of my mix, I'm, I'm often, um, or not often, but maybe sometimes called on to explain the ways of black people to white people. Um, and so this is, uh, it starts, this starts off with a tongue in cheek um, sort of explanation of a certain kind of black public loudness that is happening a lot today because it's, um, it centers around graduations. Black graduation joy, double sonnet. I speak fluent white people. Let me translate for you. Those people heard the man when he instructed the crowd to please hold your applause until all graduates have crossed the stage. Those mothers, sisters, aunties, cousins ignored him willfully. Their child on top of the usual high school bullshit, homework and hormones 
felt every day with barbed wire eyes policing their every movement through the hallways. Should the child be here? Is the child smart enough? If smart enough, quiet and disciplined enough, humble and low enough, look you in the eye and say hello enough. Every day, the child dodged rubber erasers aimed at her silhouette. Every day, the mockery of skin, of lips and nose, of the soft curve to flesh around the hips. And a history of hair stories, box braids or locks, every day pulled on as if the lead chain to a coffle. Bow your head and walk this way. Fair child. They heard please hold and were loud nevertheless. Erupted, rattled the rafters, shook the white man portraits lining the wall into the auditorium. They did what all of us should do. Send up every day praise for the child. Sing the child's survival every day. Every day, act the fool until the child is all grin and teeth and shaking a head in mock embarrassment that is an acknowledgement of love, an acknowledgement that whatever broken glass is set into the next wall to be scaled, when the child's name is called, there will always and every day be a loudness from the back, joy and bulwark against ruin, joy and bulwark against rack. I mentioned my mother in the first poem, and this poem is uh, also uh, tells some of my my mother's story um, and, and my relationship to it. And so I think it's funny um, that it's Father's Day and I'm I'm telling stories about my mom, but maybe that's just the way I look at the world and my my contrarian nature. Um, I do see that my dad is in the audience, so Happy Father's Day, Dad. I'm hoping to give you a call later in the day. Um, a black mother's child considers his lost dream of immortality. What was she hoping I'd learn? What lessons when my mother, who taught Greek at the college on the hill, read their old stories to me? To be ready one night for hooded snakes to crawl into my cradle, to leave a trail of twine behind me as I walked the labyrinthian corridors of my country, not to raise the wrong sail whenever I came home to her, not to dive as the swan and plummet into a woman bathing in the seclusion of high reeds, not to be the shock and awe of white wings. For me though, the truth and the myth was this, power transforms into life and life forever. And when my mother was finished, all I wanted was to live as those changing but unchanging gods. The white man who taught me Greek hated me. He thought I was lazy. I admit that I often slept through his morning class, often stumbled through his translations as a boar through deep sudden snow. My mother cried when she left me in the parking lot of that place cried harder than I'd seen since the week after her father died. I think she had learned that no black mother can save her children. Save them as you have proven and are still proving America from your primitive bullhorned violence. And so more days than not there, her son stood beside an aluminum keg, fermenting himself, pouring into his gullet a river not of forgetfulness, but of a needful forgetting. My mother wanted to learn Latin on her way to Greek, but her school had her pegged to cook and sew. Short but thick set, the school's own former football hero, her father traded on his glory, the scars earned for it, on his hobbled knees, the slight slur of his speech to demand a place for her in a room of primers and chalkboards. They thought she should scurry about the rooms of your house, America, picking up what you had dropped. But she overcame to stand at the front of a room, professor of language and myth. 
I told a version of this story to black children at a school in Philadelphia. When I came to the end, my mother teaching Greek at the college on the hill, they rose from their chairs and applauded her in the proxy of me. I think now I lied to them. Lied to them while standing in a room across town from where you firebombed a city block to save yourself. America, you have eaten your children to keep your place on the honeyed mountaintop. If you have not already, you will eat those children too. And still you will come with wild, ravenous hunger for more. And why do you keep doing what you do? And what will you do one day when instead of a child, you swallow a stone? Um, so despite the hard um, explorations that I think many of us have been going through over the, the past year, I, I do find myself at a, at a moment when I'm, I'm sort of hopeful that things will improve both um, because of the political situation and, and because it seems, um, you know, fingers crossed that, that we're heading towards the end of, of uh, our pandemic experience. And so I wanted to end with a poem um, that I wrote as things were getting better last summer before they, they spiked again. Um, and it was uh, based on an experience as many of my poems are just like being in the world. I, I was out for a run and, and saw one of my neighbors and wrote a poem about it. Dance Quarantine. Near the end of my run, before the road turns steeply uphill toward the house, I see a girl alone on her front lawn. The day is beautiful, cloudless and cerulean, the latest in a string of beautiful days. The girl has wound her long black hair into a tight bun and wears brown plastic framed glasses, not unlike my own, and dances. If she is dancing to music, I can't hear it but then I don't listen too intently. I want her to be dancing to music only she can hear. I imagine the virus has kept her out of a studio for months. I imagine she has danced only in her basement or to the blue glare of a computer screen disconnected from the other dancers. Besides plie, I do not have the language of dance to describe the few moves she performs while I run past. In the last one I catch, a cubist discombobulation of limbs, she arches her back until her hands touch the ground and then throws each leg separately over her head in a movement that would, if I attempted it, break into pieces my embrittled body. Whatever I become from here, I always want to be this girl. Dancing, I suppose, yes, dancing while people are dying, not out of callow or callous indifference, but in celebration of the dead, celebration expressed as survival, survival expressed as a claimant act of love, an act not native to me, but practiced until it resides in me, muscle and sinew, an imperfect act that is the only one I can think to do, dancing dancing until the imagined company of dancers spins and bends around me, until the music others cannot hear renders itself visible in my body. Dancing until each passerby believes again in cloudless and cerulean, again in this day and the possibility of the next. Thank you so much. Uh, all right, um, that brings up Nathan McLean. He is in transit, moving from uh, Massachusetts out to Illinois. So he's at a rest stop on the New York State Thruway, uh, a road that is near and dear to my heart until I get home to my parents. Um, so we, we appreciate that. I, I feel like a, a, a throughway rest stop background is in, in keeping with the ethos of the, of the series where it's, 
it's messy. You know, there were sirens going off while I was reading. My kids, I think, are watching the Yankee game. So I was just waiting for Aaron Judge to hit a home run and for screaming to happen. But um, all right, I'll turn it over to, to Nathan. Yeah, thank you so much, Ian. And thank you, Rosebud. Um, just so, so many wonderful, wonderful poems. Um, and I'm, I'm super excited for this new work that both of you are doing. And it's, it's, it's just an extreme honor to be able to share the space with you all. So um, thank you, uh, certainly to Solstice and, and to the Kitchen Table uh, Reading Series for having me. Um, I want to start uh, by reading a poem by the poet C. Dale Young, um, who was one of my mentors uh, as a grad student. Um, he has a poem from his most recent collection, Entitled Prometeo. Uh, the poem that I'll be reading today is, is entitled At Lake Merced. Some men go down to the river. I went down instead to the lake, the air silent and stretched tightly over it, the water unmoved and dangerously still. Some men move past such a scene without even the slightest notice of it. But this morning, a man in a shell rode across the lake's smooth surface, the tip of his shell leaving a widening V behind it, a shell cleanly slicing through the water like an arrow, the way an arrow slices through air or flesh. And just like that, the image of the saint pierced through with arrows becomes fixed in my head. The arrows all leaving V's behind them. V for violence, as if the very air were an impasto on camp, the canvas. And just like that, the arrows slicing through the air become bullets, each one leaving its V behind it. The paint at the target dabbed with a red duller than crimson. You may wonder why on earth a man shot through centuries ago would appear to me upon seeing this tiny shell of a boat crossing a lake. But the present day does a remarkable job of emulating the past. Let us leave it at that. Some men find nothing and others find omens everywhere. The stillness of the air above the lake the shell slicing through the water, the saint shot through with arrows, yet living, breathing, his chest heaving, his head slumping while the arms remain perfectly still. And the brown boy shot through with bullets, his wounds a red, duller than crimson. Things like this still happen almost every day. So that's C. Dale Young from his uh, collection entitled Prometeo. Um, I highly recommend it. Uh, he's a stellar poet. Uh, I think we'll stay on the water for a moment. And while I uh, must admit I do not have a, uh, a sonnet for you all, I do have a sestina. So we'll, 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 we'll stay within form to some extent. Uh, and. Uh, obviously, being in transit, I'm thinking a lot about transit. So this poem is entitled The Ferry, uh, as in the boat. The Ferry. I still had a lover. Maybe let's start there. I hitched a ride to Boston, where I missed the ferry by what seemed like minutes. But time can work that way in the mind. I was in love, or wanted to be in love, and there was distance everywhere is maybe a better way to put it. The what exactly was it? I hadn't given it a destination. I looked for the boat. It wasn't there. Only the dock, a few seagulls, a blue distance. If I was supposed to wave goodbye, I missed my chance. Though, what did I care? So in love with solitude. At least I was at the time. It seemed easy being lonely, watching time lapse, that boat long dispatched. I'd missed it, yet there I was, waving, like a fool in love, perhaps. At what? I couldn't tell. I wasn't there when the ferry left, remember? 
I missed it, or they went on without me. The distance made it hard to see clearly where distance ended, or if it did, or I didn't make it in time to see. Maybe time was against me. I missed the ferry. I had no money. The ferryman said it was fine and smiled at me. Smiled. There was the shore and me wanting to be in love, though I wasn't. I carried what I could. Love? I didn't have room for it. In the distance, I swore my solitude waved. I missed it where I was headed, sure, but there was hardly time for that. The boat was early. I boarded it and stood on the stern. Part of me was missing, but there had to be a cost. That part I missed, my mind a rough sea. I might have loved watching lap were I not so inside it. My mind, the fish too, the shore distant as the voice I thought I heard in it, as time itself. The ferry was late. I was there, hoping I missed it. I didn't trust the distance, lovely as it seemed. I didn't trust time, nor where it carried me. I knew what was there. And since it is Father's Day, I uh, thought I might read a couple poems from my debut collection, Scale, um, which Ian, I know, put in the chat. Um, I had a, certainly had a very complicated relationship with my father, uh, which this book certainly details at, uh, <laughs> at great length. Um, and uh, I'll just read a couple of poems from, from Scale. Uh, the first is entitled, uh, Fire Destroys Beloved Chicago Bakery. And uh, it is a poem, the title actually takes, uh, or uh, I take it the title from an actual newspaper headline um, that a, a friend of mine sent my way and just thought that I'd do something with. And I, I guess it's appropriate as I'm headed to Illinois. Uh, Fire Destroys Beloved Chicago Bakery. How is it that you misread fire as father, your father, come back from the dead to sweep like hard wind through the building, to smash with a Louisville slugger every pastry with which you'd pack your sweet little mouth, then flick the lit match into the trash bin. The entire building will have to be demolished because the father took hours finally to be put out it was a stubborn father, your father, who once outside a grocery store warned you against asking for anything inside, so you have learned to keep your appetites a secret. And how good you are, refusing in the drive through the hot apple pie, two for a dollar, choosing the house salad over French fries. But maybe this is why they all leave you, why you can't let him rest in peace. The real question is not why your father would do such a thing, but why you smell him in every ruin, every smoldering heap of ash and brick. This poem is entitled Landscape in Red by David Siqueiros. Landscape in Red. Whoever said that with time, the forest behind the house would come back, lied. The forest still scorched with sorrow. If you sit in ash long enough, its residue gets in your throat. Odd to think you could carry the dead forest around inside you for years, yet sometimes I'd go out back and sit in what ash hadn't blown away. Before the fire, my father left, angry. He went for a walk. That night, the forest caught fire. Firemen said, 
no one was to blame, but there's always someone. And um, I'm gonna read a, a, new, a newer poem as, uh, as some of my fellow poets have also been reading some new, some new poems as well. Um, and this one, I believe, will be part of uh, this new collection that I've been working on that'll be um, forthcoming uh, towards the end of next year, which I'm excited about. It's entitled The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn was banned and conquered Massachusetts in 1885. If you haven't read it, it's the story of two runaways, one from an abusive drunk, the other slavery. Not a terribly strange story. A boy leaves home, flees the few bed sheets snapping on the clothesline that appear to be ghosts. But these days, everyone is haunted by something. A smile, a thing someone said. I live in Amherst. Massachusetts, haunted by the name of Lord Jeffrey Amherst, who, it has been said, distributed smallpox infected blankets and handkerchiefs to Native Americans he might have called savages surrounding his fort. How many stories open that way? With some simple exchange, with some naming, bee, bullfrog, catalpa, lily pad, Nigger, even now, see how a name can stick or swat like a stick. I was never assigned Huck Finn when I was a kid, and my kid has never read it, though had she, she may have read the version that exchanges nigger for slave, a softening, so they say, like inventing a farm upstate for the dog that maybe having tracked some far off sound or movement has been crushed by a speeding car, bad dog. A dog needs a lot of space to run with other dogs and without a leash, you explain. Even a child, you think, should understand that. And I will close with a poem uh, from my dear, dear friend, uh, Tommy Blount, whose uh, who's wonderful, wonderful book, The Fantasia for the Man in Blue, was a finalist for the National Book Award, among other, um, among other awards. Um, this poem is entitled The Purse Thieves. And once again, I'm incredibly grateful uh, to have had this time with you all, and certainly to my fellow readers, Ian and Rosebud. The Purse Thieves. There was the arm, the black pricey number barely on her white shoulder in broad daylight. Why first did she have to look to my face when she screamed, stop? I did nothing except look up from the gas pump. Yes, held tight as a gun. Before I looked back down again to witness nothing, only my shadow. I saw nothing, just two boys who favored me when I was that age and always mistaken for being older. I mean, I felt nothing, except that my body was not my body anymore. Stomach shoved aside to make room for two more. I was an animal raised to be slaughtered in the name of a pricey leather number dangling from the shoulder to be stolen. It all happened so fast. My shadow bled into their shadows for a moment, a second, an eye blink as we fled across the lot. We were at play together in a race like brothers. And like brothers, just like that, the shadows broke apart and we were separated again. I saw nothing, only their bodies slid back in the slid into the back of a white van, and I slid back into my white car as if I might chase them down to save them, or I don't know. 
I did nothing. I brought both hands to my face. I heard the white van's wheels peel the afternoon like a mask I thought could never be removed, a skin. When the police sirens grew larger, I pulled my hands from my face, placed them on the steering wheel. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Nathan. That was that was powerful. First of all, um, the Sestina was was beautiful. I, I I find Sestinas can be like formal and therefore rigid, but yours are so conversational. It, it, I actually, I mean, I would have figured out that it was Sestina because there was so much repetition in it. But I think it would have taken me a while yeah. had you not had you not said that. And then um, I heard you talking about the persistence of people and ideas in, in so many different moments. Like if you sit in ash long enough, you carry the uh, the residue in your throat and see how a name can stick or swat like a stick. It's powerful, powerful work. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right, I'm going to um, close out with uh, the last section of this uh, Cyrus Cassell's poem, um, Down from the Houses of Magic. And this is section 10 of the poem. Let this earth become a heaven from the point of light within the mind of God, the earth hurling its rough house wills and lusters, the earth accruing poison, planet of joy, planet of crucifixion, pinata destined to be smashed, ashes, ashes, all the mirrors of heaven blackening, imagine, no lack, no lack, but in our human mind. Let the clematis become a prayer as clouds and cannon flowers ready sweet ungents of pollen and rain. As God bellows and a wild cavalry of wind sweeps down from the houses of magic. Down from the houses of magic. Down from the houses of magic. Thank you for spending this hour with us uh, on a busy, if you're on the East Coast, beautiful day. Um, these kitchen table readings are gonna take a, a summer hiatus um, and, and we'll see where, where we are in the fall. Um, thank you to the Solstice MFA program for, for hosting and being such uh, a vital writing program. And, and again, my home away from home. Thanks um, to our readers. If we could give one more round of applause and, and maybe some love in the chat for them, Rosebud Benoni and, and Nathan uh, McLean. Um, and uh, particular thanks to both of you for helping me celebrate the, the one year anniversary of, of this. Yeah, um, happy anniversary to Kitchen Table. Happy thank anniversary. You. <laughs> um, and so I, I, we're headed into summer and I hope it's a time of joy, of, joy, of peace and of um, reconnection for, for all of you. Thanks for stopping by.